This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens Chapter 11 The offense had been committed within the district, and indeed in the immediate neighborhood of a very notorious metropolitan police office. The crowd had only the satisfaction of accompanying Oliver through two or three streets and down a place called Mutton Hill, where he was led beneath a low archway and up a dirty court into this dispensary of summary justice by the back way. It was a small paved yard into which they turned, and here they encountered a stout man with a bunch of whiskers on his face and a bunch of keys in his hand. "'What's the matter now?' said the man carelessly. "'A young fogel hunter,' replied the man who had Oliver in charge. "'Are you the party that's been robbed, sir?' inquired the man with the keys. "'Yes, I am,' replied the old gentleman. "'But I am not sure that this boy actually took the handkerchief. "'I I would rather not press the case.' "'Must go before the magistrate now, sir,' replied the man. "'His worship will be disengaged in half a minute. "'Now, young gallows.' "'This was an invitation for Oliver to enter through a door "'which he unlocked as he spoke, "'and which led into a stone cell.' Here he was searched, and nothing being found upon him, locked up. This cell was in shape and size something like an area cellar, only not so light. It was most intolerably dirty, for it was Monday morning, and it had been tenanted by six drunken people who had been locked up elsewhere since Saturday night. But this is little. In our station houses, men and women are every night confined on the most trivial charges. The word is worth noting in dungeons, compared with which those in Newgate, occupied by the most atrocious felons, tried, found guilty, and under sentence of death, are palaces. Let anyone who doubts this compare the two. The old gentleman looked almost as rueful as Oliver when the key grated in the lock. He turned with a sigh to the book, which had been the innocent cause of all this disturbance. "'There's something in that boy's face,' said the old gentleman to himself as he walked slowly away, tapping his chin with the cover of the book in a thoughtful manner. "'Something that touches and interests me. Can he be innocent? He looked like, by the by, exclaimed the old gentleman, halting very abruptly and staring up into the sky. Bless my soul! Where have I seen something like that look before? After musing for some minutes, the old gentleman walked with the same meditative face into the back anteroom opening from the yard, and there, retiring into a corner, called before his mind's eye a vast amphitheater of faces over which a dusky curtain had hung for many years. No, said the old gentleman, shaking his head. It must be imagination. He wandered over them again. He had called them into view, and it was not easy to replace the shroud that had so long concealed them. There were the faces of friends, of foes, and of many that had been almost strangers peering intrusively from the crowd. There were the faces of young and blooming girls that were now old women. There were faces that the grave had changed and closed upon, but which the mind superior to its power still dressed in their old freshness and beauty, calling back the luster of the eyes, the brightness of the smile, the beaming of the soul through its mask of clay, and whispering a beauty beyond the tomb changed but to be heightened and taken from earth only to be set up as a light to shed a soft and gentle glow upon the path to heaven but the old gentleman could recall no one countenance of which oliver's features bore a trace so he heaved a sigh over the recollections he awakened and being happily for himself an absent old gentleman buried them again in the pages of the musty book 
He was roused by a touch on the shoulder and a request from the man with the keys to follow him into the office. He closed his book hastily and was at once ushered into the imposing presence of the renowned Mr. Fang. The office was a front parlor with a paneled wall. Mr. Fang sat behind a bar at the upper end, and on one side the door was a sort of wooden pen in which poor little Oliver was already deposited, trembling very much at the awfulness of the scene. Mr. Fang was a lean, long-backed, stiff-necked, middle-sized man with no great quantity of hair and what he had growing on the back and sides of his head. His face was stern and much flushed. If he were really not in the habit of drinking rather more than was exactly good for him, he might have brought action against his countenance for libel and have recovered heavy damages. The old gentleman bowed respectfully, and advancing to the magistrate's desk, said, That is my name and address, sir, suiting the action to the word. He then withdrew a pace or two, and with another polite and gentlemanly inclination of his head, waited to be questioned. Now it so happened that Mr. Fang was at that moment perusing a leading article in a newspaper of the morning, advertising to some recent decision of his, and commending him for the 350th time to the special and particular notice of the Secretary of State for the Home Department. He was out of temper, and he looked up with an angry scowl. Who are you? said Mr. Fang. The old gentleman pointed with some surprise to his card. Officer, said Mr. Fang, tossing the card contemptuously away with the newspaper. Who is this fellow? My name, sir, said the old gentleman, speaking like a gentleman. My name, sir, is Brown Now. Permit me to inquire the name of the magistrate who offers a gratuitous and unprovoked insult to a respectable man under the protection of the bench. Saying this, Mr. Brownlow looked around the office as if in search of some person who would afford him the required information. Officer, said Mr. Fang, throwing the paper on one side. What's this fellow charged with? He's not charged at all, your worship, replied the officer. He appears against this boy, your worship. His worship knew this perfectly well, but it was a good annoyance and a safe one. Appears against the boy, does he? said Mr. Fang, surveying Brownlow contemptuously from head to foot. Swear him. Before I am sworn, I must beg to say one word, said Mr. Brownlow. And that is that I never, with actual experience, could have believed. Hold your tongue, sir, said Mr. Fang peremptorily. I will not, sir, replied the old gentleman. Hold your tongue this instant, or I'll have it turned out of the office, said Mr. Fang. You're an insolent, impertinent fellow. How dare you bully a magistrate? What? exclaimed the old gentleman, reddening. Swear this person, said Fang to the clerk. I'll not hear another word. Swear him. Mr. Brownlow's indignation was greatly roused, but reflecting perhaps that he might only injure the boy by giving vent to it, he suppressed his feelings and submitted to be sworn at once. Now, said Fang, what's the charge against this boy? What have you got to say, sir? I was standing at the bookstall, Mr. Brownlow began. Hold your tongue, sir, said Mr. Fang. Policeman, where's the policeman? Here, swear this policeman. Now, policeman, what is this? The policeman, with becoming humility, related how he had taken the charge, how he had searched Oliver and found nothing on his person, and how that was all he knew about it. Are there any witnesses? inquired Mr. Fang. None, your worship, replied the policeman. Mr. Fang sat silent for some minutes, and then, turning round to the prosecutor, said in a towering passion, Do you mean to state what your complaint against this boy is, man, or do you not? 
You have been sworn. Now, if you stand there refusing to give evidence, I'll punish you for disrespect to the bench. I will by... By what or by whom, nobody knows, for the clerk and jailer coughed very loud just at the right moment, and the former dropped the heavy book upon the floor, thus preventing the word from being heard, accidentally, of course. With many interruptions and repeated insults, Mr. Brownlow contrived to state his case, observing that, in the surprise of the moment, he had run after the boy because he had saw him running away, and expressing his hope that if the magistrate should believe him, although not actually the thief, to be connected with the thieves, he would deal as leniently with him as justice would allow. He has been hurt already, said the old gentleman in conclusion, and I fear he added with great energy, looking towards the bar. I really fear that he is ill. Oh, yes, I dare say, said Mr. Fang with a sneer. Come, none of your tricks here, you young vagabond. That won't do. What's your name? Oliver tried to reply, but his tongue failed him. He was deadly pale, and the whole place seemed turning round and round. What's your name, you hardened scoundrel? demanded Mr. Fang. Officer, what's his name? This was addressed to a bluff old fellow in a striped waistcoat who was standing by the bar. He bent over Oliver and repeated the inquiry, but finding him really incapable of understanding the question and knowing that his not replying would only infuriate the magistrate the more and add to the severity of his sentence, he hazarded a guess. His name's Tom White, your worship, said the kind-hearted thief-taker. Oh, he won't speak out, won't he? said Fang. Very well, very well, where does he live? Where he can, your worship? replied the officer again, pretending to receive Oliver's answer. Has he any parents? inquired Mr. Fang. He says they died in his infancy, your worship, replied the officer, hazarding the usual reply. At this point of the inquiry, Oliver raised his head and, looking round with imploring eyes, murmured a feeble prayer for a draught of water. Stuff and nonsense, said Mr. Fang. Don't try to make a fool of me. I think he's really ill, your worship, remonstrated the officer. I know better, said Mr. Fang. Take care of him, officer, said the old gentleman, raising his hands instinctively. He'll fall down. Stay away, officer, cried Fang. Let him if he likes. Oliver availed himself of the kind permission and fell to the floor in a fainting fit. The men in the office looked at each other, but no one dared to stir. I knew he was shamming, said Fang, as if this were incontestable proof of the fact. Let him lie there. He'll soon be tired of that. How do you propose to deal with the case, sir? inquired the clerk in a low voice. Summarily, replied Mr. Fang. He stands committed for three months. Hard labor, of course. Clear the office. The door was open for this purpose, and a couple of men were preparing to carry this insensible boy to his cell, when an elderly man of decent but poor appearance, clad in an old suit of black, rushed hastily into the office and advanced toward the bench. Stop! Stop! Don't take him away! For heaven's sake, stop a moment! cried the newcomer, breathless with haste. Although the presiding Jedi in such an office as this exercises summary and arbitrary power over the liberties, the good name, the character, almost the lives of Her Majesty's subjects, especially of the poor class, and although within such walls enough fantastic tricks are daily played to make the angels blind with weeping, they are closed to the public, save through the medium of the daily press or were virtually then, Mr. Fang was consequently not a little indignant to see an unbidden guest enter in such irreverent disorder. Who is this? Who is this? Turn this man out! Clear the office! cried Mr. Fang. I will speak! cried the man. 
I will not be turned out. I saw it all. I kept the book stall. I demand to be sworn. I will not be put down. Mr. Fang, you must hear me. You must not refuse, sir. The man was right. His manner was determined, and the matter was growing rather too serious to be hushed up. Swear the man, growled Mr. Fang with a very ill grace. Now, man, what have you got to say? This, said the man. I saw three boys, two others, and the prisoner here, loitering on the opposite side of the way, when this gentleman was reading. The robbery was committed by another boy. I saw it done, and I saw that this boy was perfectly amazed and stupefied by it. Having by this time recovered a little breath, the worthy bookstall keeper proceeded to relate in a more coherent manner. The exact circumstances of the robbery. Why didn't you come here before? Said Fang after a pause. I hadn't a soul to mind the shop, replied the man. Everybody who could have helped me had joined in the pursuit. I could get nobody till five minutes ago, and I've run here all the way. The prosecutor was reading, was he? Inquired Fang after another pause. Yes. Replied the man, the very book he has in his hand. Oh, that book, eh?、Hey? Said Fang. Is it paid for? No, it is not. Replied the man with a smile. Dear me, I forgot all about it! Exclaimed the absent old gentleman innocently. A nice person to prefer charge against a poor boy! Said Fang with a comical effort to look humane. I consider, sir, that you have obtained possession of that book under very suspicious and disreputable circumstances, and you may think yourself very fortunate that the owner of the property declines to prosecute. Let this be a lesson to you, my man, or the law will overtake you yet. The boy is discharged. Clear the office. The mandate was obeyed. The indignant Mr. Brown now was conveyed out with the book in one hand and the bamboo cane in the other, in a perfect frenzy of rage and defiance. He reached the yard, and his passion vanished in a moment. Little Oliver Twist lay on his back on the pavement, with his shirt unbuttoned and his temples bathed with water. His face a deadly white, and a cold tremble convulsing his whole frame. Oh, boy! Said Mr. Brown, now bending over him. Oh, look, coach! Somebody, pray, directly! A coach was obtained, and Oliver, having been carefully laid on the seat, the old gentleman got in and sat himself in the other. May I accompany you? Said the bookstall keeper, looking in. Bless me, yes, my dear sir," said Mr. Brown now quickly. "I forgot you, dear, dear. I have this unhappy book still. Jump in, poor fellow. There's no time to lose." The bookstall keeper got into the coach, and away they drove. End of chapter eleven.